Hi, my name is Griselda Castillo. I'm a poet and a short story writer from Laredo, Texas, and I live in Austin currently. So, first of all, tell us about yourself. Um, well, I am a Mexican-American, uh, first-generation uh, child of immigrants. Um, I've been living in Austin for a little over 10 years now, um, and I am originally from a border town in Texas, Laredo, Texas. Um, I've been writing for a very long time. I studied creative writing while I was at uh, college and in the university kind of arena, where I started getting not serious, but more educated as to kind of what poets were out there. It wasn't very much of a Mexican-American or a Latino-focused um, study, but um, it did lay the foundation for me as far as like what poets uh, and writers uh, influenced me or people that I really interested in. It basically just broke my world open. Once I moved out uh, and came back to Texas, um, I started, um, you know, having odd jobs here and there and writing took kind of a backseat to that until I woke up one day and I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, why did I go and get this incredible education if I'm not putting it to use? So one day I decided that I was going to put all my efforts and all my energy into writing poems and performing, trying to get myself published. And once I started putting that momentum behind my work, beautiful things started happening. And, you know, I started uh, uh, getting a few publications here and there. I started getting invites to um, certain poetry festivals, meeting amazing people along the way who have mentored me and helped me kind of grow as a writer. And then stuff just kind of took off from there. I, it took me about a year to get my uh, chapbook of poems uh, finally ready to share and to be published. And Lo and behold, once I put it together, I sent it in as, as a submission to a chapbook contest and I won an award. So um, it's been a whirlwind. I've been kind of uh, writing the tales of that amazing uh, high for the last few months. So Blood and Pilancio is the book that allowed you to win the 2018 Knox Award, right? Yes. Tell me a little about uh, us a little bit about your book. Sure. It is a, uh, it's a bilingual book of poetry, um, and it's uh, centered around uh, several events that were of importance or affected me in a certain way. So there's it's a little tiny book of 10 poems that I've been working for on for a long time. Um, there's Spanish through uh, interwoven kind of throughout the book, and I offer no translation. There's no, like, notes. There's no, there's no nothing. I really expect my reader to... Um, um, research what it is that I'm trying to say, put a little bit of effort into getting to know me and getting involved in my culture. I think that that's a really important aspect of the book. The fact that I, I'm challenging the reader in many ways to learn about where I come from. So they're all kind of centered on either being uh, at the border, thinking about the border, they're about my identity, they're about my family, um, they're about being two people at once, two identities at once, they're about having two voices. So it's a book that's very much about my Mexican-American experience in America. And how have people reacted to your book? What have you heard from your readers? Um, I've gotten a lot of reactions. I've gotten a lot of positive reactions, which is something that I didn't, I didn't expect. Um, no one's asked me to translate the book. No one's asked me to add notes to it. No, no one's asked that. So I think that people are up for the challenge. I got, um, a couple of really cool comments. One from an older lady who said, you know, I'm really happy that you're not translating, uh, your work because you're helping to decolonize uh, the poetry world out there. And I thought that was like mind boggling because it wasn't something that I was thinking about. And then I had the pleasure of going down to uh, UT Brownsville to uh, sit in on one of Chris Carmona's classes. He asked me to come and talk about my work and my books there. So I went down there and um, in talking about that, about the fact that I don't translate my work and that I'm very, you know, bilingual, I try to influence it with my Spanish culture. Um, one of the girls that was part of the class came up to me afterwards and she was like, I'm so happy that you write in the way that you do because it's inspired me to not have to write in English. And I thought that was amazing. It was one of the most heartfelt things that I've ever heard. I hope that she's writing today um, because I knew that she was feeling somewhat intimidated about being a Mexican, uh, a Mexican student in an American college trying to write about her experience. So it's, it was kind of like, I think it's so good that you're uh, writing in a bilingual fashion and that you're not allowing translation because it's giving me the freedom 
to be able to express myself that way too. So I've gotten some really good uh, feedback about it. Chris Carmona also um, gave me some really interesting feedback too, because I never, he's a very political poet. You know, he's a, a poet who responds to the political climate of the time and he's very much involved with current events. He's uh, He's got a, a relationship with what's going on in the world. And I don't really see myself that way, but once he started getting to know my work and reading my poems and getting to know my style, he showed me how much of a political stance that was for me, how me just writing from my identity and from the place uh, where I um, mix both of my cultures was in itself an act of resistance. And I never ever thought about it that way. So I've gotten some really good feedback from my poems that uh, I wouldn't have ever have, have come around to on my own. So it's been, it's been pretty good. I've gotten some pretty good feedback, nothing negative so far. Actually, I also attended the same reading and I saw that the audience really liked and were really happy that you wrote in two languages, English and Spanish. Usually in school, we're taught that there is only one dominant language, English. There's one language to read in and there's only that one language to write in. And you were showing people that it's okay to embrace both languages. There really isn't a language overpowering the other in your work. And I think that is very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, I strongly believe in that. And I think that especially being from the border, the border in Texas is a very unique area. And as you know, you, you're living in, in a different part of the border too. English doesn't really have a dominance over Spanish there. Spanish doesn't really have a dominance over English there. It's like a beautiful mix of both those languages. So I really wanted to um, capture what my voice was and in doing that writing in like the weird not it's not spanglish you know because they're spanish words and english words but writing in that kind of mixed um manner felt very authentic to me as 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 far as trying to capture who i am so the voice that you're writing with is also what inspires others like the student you mentioned earlier it's what teaches others that it's okay to write in both languages would you say that that's the main reason you're writing today to inspire others or what is your main purpose in writing now? Like what's the purpose? Why, what, why am I motivated to write? Well, or what do you hope your writing achieves? Do you write with a purpose in mind? What is it that drives you to keep writing? Um, so I don't think that I write for a purpose. I don't think that I, I go, when I'm ready to write a poem, I don't think that I, I'm like, okay, well, this poem is going to be about uh, what it's like to be a woman. Like, I don't think that I ever approach it in that way with that kind of like outlined uh, purpose. I, I don't think that I approach it that way. I, uh, there are things in my life that are meaningful or that pull me in a direction or that maybe confuse me or that I'm trying to uh, overcome stuff that's painful, stuff that's joyous and those kind of motivations bring me to bring me to the poem. So it's on, on the back end, right, on, on creating the poems yourself, it's a very selfish act because you're kind of doing it by yourself. You're being self-motivated. You have no choice really on, on what motivates you or what brings you to the page. That's been my experience so far. Once the poem is done and I'm sharing it with others, then I think that's where more so than purpose, but meaning comes in, you know, because you're inviting other people in there. They're listening to your experience. It's coloring their experience of, of, of what they're feeling, hearing your words. And I think once that conversation begins, once you begin a dialogue with your audience like that, you really begin to see what the purpose was, you know. So I don't think that I approach the writing in order to uh, make other people listen and feel like, hey, it's okay for me to write in the different way that I do. I don't think that's why I started, but having shared my work and having heard that from others, I do think that that's my purpose. I, I took, I recently took a, a uh, workshop with um, Irene uh, Lara Silva, mm -hmm. and one of the first ways that she um, began her poetry workshop, she said, you're free. You're free to do what you want. You're free to share your poems, to share your voice. You're free to write from your experience. You are just liberated. You're free. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. And when she said that to me, I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. You know, we try to make it seem like there's a certain package that we're trying to create with a poem or with a piece of work. 
but you're not, you know, there, there aren't any rules out there anymore. There isn't something that you need to follow. There isn't a formula. There isn't anything like that. I think the most important thing is to find what's authentic to you and to find uh, your voice because there's, there's no, no voice like yours. You know, I can't remember what famous writer said, but it's like, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I approach it. That's what I think is the most important part is I want to hear about your experience. I don't want you to emulate someone. I've already read that. You know, I want to see what's different about you. And what was it that drew you to writing in the first place? Um, I think it was just like a natural act. You know, I'm, I'm very, I'm nostalgic by nature. You know, I'm reflective. I'm always looking back on things that happened. I'm always trying to figure out why it was that way, why it wasn't another way. So I think that that's a big, a big motivator for me. Like what draws me to writing is like this never ending search for the truth. You know, what is true to me? What is true about me? Um, this never ending curiosity, you know, what is that like? What, why does this feel this way? And then also like, there's a little bit of, uh, of masochism in there too, you know, because I tend to focus on the stuff that's painful. You know, I tend to focus on the stuff that's dark, on the stuff that's, um, you know, right up against uh, loss and death. Like I tend to focus on that because it's, it's the stuff that um, that feels real to me, you know, like I don't shy away from my pain and I don't shy away from my suffering, you know, because I really want to understand that pain and suffering so that I don't go through it anymore. So a lot of that draws me to write, figuring out what this crazy life means, you know, and what what my life means. So I think that's what it is. You know, poetry helps me in my quest for meaning. So writing poetry is a cathartic experience for you. Right. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, you know, like, um, there's a poem in the chapbook called Laundry that's not about me, but it's about my sister whose husband uh, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And me and her never really talked about what that pain was for her, you know, like, I don't feel like we ever got around to talking about that, because of course, it was so painful for her, it was something that she couldn't face. But in trying to get that closure and trying to get closer to her and trying to understand what it was that she went through. I wrote that poem because I had to imagine what it was like to go through that. So in a way it was, it's not necessarily cathartic for me, but I felt like it would have been for her, you know? Yes. Yeah. When you're writing about these dark themes, pain, death, loss, does it ever become too much? I imagine it can be really difficult to write about sometimes. Um, yes, it, it doesn't ever become too much. One, I think because that's just what the stuff that I'm drawn to, you know, like even in my poems that are about happiness and about joy and love, you know, there's all these like dead harmful things in it. <laughs> it just, it's just what I'm drawn to. But I think that um, a big driver of of what I do is also to make that beautiful. Like, where is the beauty in this pain? Where is the beauty in this grief? What is it about this that makes us love life more? What is this about, you know, a person that makes us appreciate them more? So there's always that turn of phrase, like that it's, you know, really trying to make these experiences, these moments beautiful, because I think that's really what, what poetry is about. How can I connect with that pain or that suffering or that incident, how can I connect with that experience? And then also be reminded of the beauty in the world and in the beauty that life is. Um, so it's a little bit of both, you know, it doesn't, I don't think that it ever gets difficult because as an artist, you always try to kind of make that acceptable and palatable to the world, also to you. But there are some subjects that I'm not ready to write about. Like for instance, my my mother had a heart attack not not a few like a few years ago and i still haven't been able to write that poem about a broken heart you know what i mean like my parents are getting older life is changing um they've gone through so many things but i still can't get to that just yet so there are some things that i don't think i'm emotionally ready to write about mm -hmm. uh, they're still kind of ruminating i'm still processing what it is but once i do i'll be able to make it into something that i can that i can see the beauty in can you share a little bit about your writing process? Um, like, what do you mean? Like, how do you choose your next topic? You know, what do you do when you're working on a poem? I know a lot of people, they struggle with writer's block. It's it's hard to start, hard to finish. You know, what, what do you do? So, 
Um, I had the pleasure of uh, listening to Junot Diaz um, at, at Texas State University not too long ago. And he he's such an acclaimed writer, you know, like he's written so much. He's so prolific. He's he's a, a, so per, a perfectionist, too. Like it doesn't feel like any of his work is ever un, 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 unfinished. But he said that one of his biggest things, like his biggest challenge is actually getting to sit down and to write. He, he called it like getting to the desk or something like that. And I think that's my biggest challenge. My biggest challenge is getting to the desk. I, I write for a living. I, I am lucky enough to have a career as a writer. It pays my bills. It pays my rent. But because I'm expending all that energy at work, it's hard to come home and then also write a poem, you know. So that's really difficult. Um, as far as my process and how I pick my subjects, it really just depends. Like it depends on what I'm feeling. It depends on what I'm thinking. It depends on what bubbles up to the, you know, the conscious part of my brain, especially if I've been like, um, you know, thinking about stuff from my childhood or thinking about stuff that, that happened within my family structure or something like that. So the subjects are always a little bit hard. Like I learned um, in college about the objective correlative, how if you're going to let's say write about death, you don't write about death, but maybe you write about like what that dead person wore, or maybe you write about like what they used to eat, or you make it about an object so that you can focus that kind of abstraction around that object. So I use that technique a lot, you know, because I mean, even if you try it, if you try to write a poem that's head on directly about death, you're not gonna get very far with that poem. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if you can write about like, I don't know, the shirt your grandpa used to wear or how your grandma used to comb her hair or something like that, then you can get to the subject and kind of get it around there. So that when it comes to writing about difficult things, I always try to find the object that I can focus on. As far as ideas, I get a lot of ideas when I'm driving or when I'm traveling or when I'm in between one place where you're not really supposed to be here. You're not really supposed to be there. No one's like expecting anything from you. I think that in those kind of like transitional spaces is where I feel like the most free. And I also just kind of jot ideas down. So it just all depends. You know, sometimes I'll steal stuff. <laughs> like um, I'll hear my husband, my husband will say something like, interesting and I'll be like oh you know that's a really interesting like phrase and then I'll build something around it or I'll meet another interesting person or another writer and they have certain things that they do and so you end up picking up these little things around the way it's just you know uh just get to it is really the, the trick there like if you're gonna be a writer the only way you can do it is to actually sit your ass down and write like just get to it. You can think about it all the time. You can brainstorm as much as you want, but you're not writing unless you're writing. So I think that that's a really important thing for anyone who's starting to write. Like, you just get to it. Just get to the desk and start writing, and it doesn't matter. And you know, fall in love with your shitty drafts. Fall in love with your uh, your starting places and your messes and your uh, failures. Be in love with that stuff because from that is where all the good writing is going to come. You know, and and if you're a poet or if you're a writer who thinks that you're going to wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, one time and it's done type poetry, type writing. I mean, there's very few people who can do that. You really just have to sit there and do the grunt work. And how long does it take for you for each piece? Oh, well, it takes a long time. Like there. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are involved with writing and rewriting. Right. Like you. Let's say, so let's say, uh, like, one of my poems, so, uh, let's pick, I don't know, Elgin. Mm -hmm. So Elgin started as an assignment at a writer's retreat. I get invited to this writer's retreat once a year. I love to do it. It's all women. It's at a beautiful ranch outside of Austin, and it's really good. And it's always uh, led by two former teachers who give you an assignment, and then you start writing. So that's kind of where Elgin was born. Elgin was born in Elgin because that's where the ranch is out of this kind of grouping of people and this kind of assignment. So it was like I got a writing assignment and I, I got the first draft of Elgin outside out of that. Then take some time, you know, you come back to it, you start hearing it, it's a little bit different, you read it out loud, you start changing things and it takes a while. You know, as a poet, you have to be able to give yourself the amount of distance you need so that you can come back to a piece of work 
and and perfect it. You know, I don't think that any poem that I've I've written or that it has been published is perfect, but it's as perfect as I'm going to get it at the time that I'm writing it. So um, I had the the pleasure of uh, going to this event here called On Story, and one of the writers that they were featuring was the one of the co-writers for uh, Guillermo del Toro's film The Shape of Water. And, she helped Guillermo del Toro write the script, and she had a really interesting piece of advice that I was like, wow, I never really thought about it that way, but it's really true. She said, you can either share your draft with another writer, or you can give yourself three days and then come back to it with a fresh pair of eyes. And I think that that's really valuable. You have to give yourself some distance between what you're writing and what you want it to become in order so that you can be that editor for you. So it takes a long time. I want to say that Elgin, I probably worked on Elgin for something like eight months. And that was like a combination of like rewrites, of write, of reading my work out loud when it wasn't totally finished, of sharing it with friends, um, of putting it through workshops. So it took a long time. But it, um, I'm really proud of how that poem kind of finished a little bit. And um, yeah, the process, it depends. You know, I, I take a long time to write because... I'm so impulsive and emotional that I want to make sure that what I'm writing is accurate to the experience I'm trying to portray. And you mentioned a lot of workshops and events that you attend. Would you say that artists should strive to attend as many workshops as they can or? Um, I don't know if it's about attending. I don't know if it's about like attending events, but it's definitely about your community. You know, like there's, Mm -hmm. there's only so much that you can do on your own. Definitely, definitely push yourself, you know, so that you can perfect that style of writing, but feedback, communication, sharing your work with others. That's really what makes it art. You know, that's really what takes it out of something that you're just kind of working on and journaling into something that's interacting with the world. So yes, it's very difficult for writers to find a community, but it's been very valuable to me. And it's been very helpful because it helps me push work out. Um, And then it's good feedback, you know, like also choose who you're getting feedback from, you know what I mean? Like you don't want to have somebody who just completely hates your writing tell you how much they hate your writing all the time. You need to find people that really understand who you are, what you're trying to do, and then keep them involved in what it is that you're doing. So I get a lot of, I get a lot of uh, good feedback from events, a lot of good feedback from um, workshops. And if you truly want to get out there, you know, and have people in your community know who you are and listen to you and hear your voice, you've got to get out there go to open mics, you know, go to the poetry events that, that are around your town, go to the writing events that are around your town, support others so that they can support you as well. So another question that I have is what advice do you have for other artists who might be struggling right now? I think that if you're an artist who's struggling, you're on the right path. You are doing the right thing. If it's hard, if it's difficult, if you're unsatisfied, but you keep at it, you are doing the right things. You're headed in the right direction. When I gave myself like the goal of, of writing seriously and getting published the first year that I was writing, everything was shitty. (laughs) Everything was horrible. Like I would read it and I'd be like, what are you doing? But you have to get yourself out of that space and you can only do it by pushing out work and by pushing out work and also by getting rejected left and right. You know, like my first year of trying to get into a magazine or trying to get into a published uh, piece of work or something like that was filled with rejection. Everybody was saying, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. And it was really difficult. You know, you have to build that resilience. You have to build that kind of like a thick skin and also don't give up, you know, because there's, so many people that are writing now. There's so many people that are trying to get into the same magazines and books that you are, but there's only one you. So you're going to find an opportunity somewhere. You just have to put in the time. So my advice to young writers is to put in the time. Get in love with your shitty drafts and share your work, no matter how embarrassing you think that it is, because once you put it out there, good things start to happen and and you kind of get the ball rolling. Do you have any tips on how to get published in the first place? Read. 
Read a lot and um, find magazines that you feel you might fit into. Like if you're, for instance, like my bilingual poetry is probably not going to get into the New Yorker. You know what I mean? Like, and honestly, I don't know if it ever would or if I ever would want it to because it's not my audience and it's not like who I am. It's not like an intellectual type of, I'm not that kind of a poet. So I don't think that I would ever fit in there. So I think that you definitely read, you know, read as much as you can support small presses because they're trying to find, you know, they're your platform. They're trying to find writers to fill their, their, their covers with. They're trying to uplift people who haven't had that opportunity before, who don't have that voice yet, who don't have that command yet. So look to your small presses to support. And, you know, um, uh, Blood and Piloncillo, the chapbook that I wrote, was published by Pocho Press, which is a tiny press out of South Texas that I that you know believed in me, and 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 then look what happened; it won an award. So I definitely think that you know support your friends, support your small presses, support your community, and uh, if it, if you're really trying to get into a magazine, like if you have one in mind that you want to get to, read it and and see who's contributing and um, see if the, see if you can actually fit into that as well. One thing that I will also share with you is. I don't think that writers need to conform to stuff anymore. You know what I mean? I think that we, we've we gone to a point in our, just in our lives and in our society in general where you don't have to be conventional anymore. You don't have to try to fit into a box anymore. That doesn't mean like don't refine your poems and don't turn in half-assed work, but you don't have to fit into someone's box. There's going to be somebody who's going to hear your voice or read your poems and be like, yeah, I believe in that person. They should be in here. And it's just like, it's just a matter of just plugging away. Just send it, send it, send it. The more you send, um, the more of a network you'll find. And get used to being rejected because that's a big part of the writing process too. Now, can you read and talk about the poems that are being specially featured in the spring 2018 issue of the Chachalaka Review? Sure. Um, so I uh, submitted three poems, and I'll, I'll read them kind of out of order um, and tell you a little bit about them. So I, I am a bilingual poet, but not a lot, uh, not all of my submissions or not all of my poems are ever bilingual, especially when I'm writing about um, my husband or if I'm writing about that part of my family. My husband is white. He's from Washington State. Um, so it's a whole different culture. And I notice when I write about him, that Spanish part doesn't come in, right? Obviously, because it's not about a Spanish person. It's about someone from a different culture. So I'll start with that one. Um, this is a poem called On the Train from Seattle. And um, it's about a time. So it's about a time where, where me and Jim kind of went back and, and visited his family. And every time I go back to visit, like, his gente, I try to get as much information as I can so that I can understand him better as a human being. So this was our train ride uh, from Seattle to central Washington, where he's from. And he was so excited that we were going to go on this train trip. He was like, you're not going to believe how beautiful the land is. And it was, it was absolutely gorgeous. And so on the train, because he was so excited to show me like where he was from and, and this part of, of the Cascades, because it's a really beautiful mountain range, I tried my hardest to use the landscape as a vehicle to get to know him a little bit better, to get closer to him. So this is a poem called On the Train from Seattle. Pines and rivers outline your granite insides like a map. We cut through cold mountains and streams of emerald seas until you yawn and they drain into a mouth cave. Waters recede for herons to hunt crustaceans along the coastline of your muddy heart. Will they find limbs in the evergreens or extract old bones from moss and mushrooms? Will I ever smell the rich black earth you have for blood? The offspray of the mind Bring details at morse, as morsels, but only fill me with the mystery of a blue spruce dripping beneath muted lightning in August as you say, don't leave the matches out here. It'll probably rain again. 
So that's a little poem about getting to know my husband through the vehicle of like a mountain and the birds of the area and the landscape of the area. I was trying to make it to where a map could be a human being. Interesting, but weird. <laughs> okay. Um, so then let's go back to poems that are more about where I'm from. So I wrote a poem called Vampiros. Um, this poem has gotten a lot of attention, but I haven't chosen to publish it until now. So Chachalaca, congratulations. You guys got the fucking Vampiros poem. Yay! Yay, thank you. <laughs> and um, this poem began as a short story, which is why it's much longer than any of the other work that I've done. Um, and I also perform it with a jazz band. So usually there's a band behind me who's playing music to this, and and it's a really like fast-paced kind of poem with like this, uh, this band behind me. But um, I chose to put it on paper because it's a, a really interesting experiment for me. Um, so Vampiros is... Is actually not about vampires it's about a drink called the vampiro which is um, a tequila based drink of course I'm Mexican um, and it is if the margarita had a boyfriend it would be the vampiro it's a spicy drink it's made with tequila it's got a chili dusted rim and when I was living in Laredo when I was still living like at my parents house being underage, the only place where you could drink would be across in Mexico. And so oftentimes my friends and I would go across to Mexico when it was still safe. It's no longer, it wasn't, no long, it wasn't safe for, the, for a while. So we stopped going, but when it was still relatively safe, we would go back there and have these drinks. And, and then I just, I wrote a poem about them. So this is a poem called Vampiros. We were itching. Thirsting for blood, for that sweet red nectar served in a martini glass with a chili dusted rim. A warm sunset spread over the Rio Grande as we drove toward the bridge. We gave shiny American quarters to children at low street lights, paid the toll for the magic of those sweet and spicy drinks, and sped past Paseo Cristobal, past maquiladoras and cuadras that went on for miles, six foot cinder block fences, metal storefronts and neon signs until we reached the bar and ordered two drinks each in martini glasses with chili dusted rims. We savored those vampiros slinking down our throats, how they lubricated every dark star we encountered. Our pulses drowned out the music as we raised our glasses to the night for giving us blood. Blood drunk, we latched on to people fighting over depths and when the rent was due, smacked mosquitoes into our necks, realizing that even in Mexico, we felt the tiny pricks of life's teeth, saw how we all saw how we are all vampires turning into adults paling at the responsibilities that come with the dawn. It was clear as we drove back across the bridge to Laredo that soon the English necessary to get us over the border would not be enough to slake our growing bloodlust. We'd have to look beyond the river for remedies and hook onto heartbeats for answers. Back home, cool bed sheets waited for my neck and collarbones to rest, for my eyes to sleep, provided a temporary cure for the itch, but I know now what I always knew then. I will always be itchy. I will always be thirsty. Um, and then the last poem that I'll read is a very new poem. And by new poem, I mean that I finished this like last week. Um, so in part of, of being like a, a, a responsible poet in the community, I also enjoy giving back quite a lot. So um, the Austin International Poetry Festival was really awesome. And they invited me to do a poetry workshop um, this last fest, which was a couple of weeks ago. And so for my bilingual poetry workshop, we wrote some poems based on a little assignment that I created where we read some bilingual poets and then also created a word bank and then out of that word bank created some poetry. And we were able to either use each other's words or just stick to our words. So it was just a really interesting way of getting people to, to build that sort of uh, foundation for their poems and then having them write creative stuff out of that. So. This poem came out of that, um, and it was uh, based off of like 10 words that some of the, the students in the workshop that, uh, that they provided, and um, it's an assignment poem. So this is a, a very different kind of approach for me. I don't usually like to do it this way, but once I started working on it, I was like, wow, I was really pleased with it. So um, this is a brand new poem um, that I am uh, submitting to Chachalaca Review, and I hope that you guys like it. It's called Contraband Birken. Put your lentes on so you can see me better. 
Your monita de oro, little golden doll of your dreams. Sácame del shop and hide me in your black bolsa palanquin. Carry me across the empty botellas lining riverbanks like shiny cascaras. Mira como los glass husks reflect paloma doves courting one another. Grip your hand around my dark body y no te asustes. It is spring and as long as I am with you, no estás sola. Siente mi energía as we make it through customs y luego cómprame rosas de ofrenda and I'll hold vigil from the cama. Little golden doll of your dreams. Thank you. Thank you.